Hey everyone, it is January 30, 2014. I'm Rene Ritchie, and right now we're going to talk about Facebook Paper. We're going to talk about uh, Lenovo buying, what do they buy? Motorola. And we're going to talk about maybe Apple TV rumors. Who knows? This is the iMore Show. Joining me as always, we have the managing editor of iMore and Internet Bon Vivant, Peter Cohen. How are you, Peter? Good. How are you, Rene? I'm doing very well, thank you. Also joining us, we have the ace reporter, senior editor from 9 to 5 Mac, Mr. Mark Herman. How are you, Mark? Doing well. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for joining me. Uh, I know that the minute Facebook um, paper was announced, you just couldn't wait to talk about it. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be brutally honest here. I have not looked at it. <laughs> I watched like 10 seconds of the video. It seemed pretty dramatic, like most uh, big Apple launches are these days. Uh, totally unrealistic as well in terms of how people probably live their daily lives. But, you know, it seems like an interesting competitor to the likes of uh, Flipboard and Pulse. Uh, that space, you know, it's been going for a couple of years now, the, you know, news reading apps. And I think Facebook with their user base and the resources could make a good dent in the market. More competition, the better. So what I want to know, let me ask you this in general then. Um, We've seen Samsung announce new tablets at CES. They have a ridiculous 500 PPI on the small one. But what they did is across the entire slew of tablets, they made this new magazine UI. Uh, it was it was such a big change. In fact, Google went to them and said, yeah, please, please don't do that again. Can you cut that out? Can you stick with Android? But they thought that normal humans would better relate to a Flipboard and you know, it's blatantly Flipboard style interface. And now Facebook... Uh, is doing the same thing. And you have Mike Mattis, incredibly talented, worked at Apple on the Photos app, on the camera apps. You have uh, Lauren Brichter Consulting, also worked at Apple, made Tweety, made um, Letterpress. These are some amazing guys who all happen to have friends who are so much better looking than my friends, except for you guys, but so much better looking than my friends. But Mark, do you think that this is a kind of UI that average people actually would do better at than a traditional icon-based UI or traditional iPhone UI? Uh, perhaps. I mean, the data that there's that's out there is, you know, iOS versus Android. People in their customer satisfaction survey seem to really like uh, how iOS works in general. But I know Flipboard is extremely popular, uh, and that's magazine-style UI. And of course, the whole concept of how a magazine works has been tried and proven for a hundred, for a hundred, even a hundred years with actual physical paper. So clearly, it's something that people relate to. But again, it's moving back to the whole you know, skeuomorphism versus flat debate. Why are we bringing back, you know, the way of the world from decades ago into a time that we have all this advanced technology? Um, so I think that it, it's really interesting because you see Apple and Microsoft going in one direction and then Facebook and uh, Flipboard and all these other companies going in a totally other direction. So we'll have to see what the next few years brings us to see if they continue going, the, going down that route or come up with a new type of interface altogether. It's amazing to me, Peter, that Facebook is willing to let Mike Mattis and his team do... I mean, they let him do chat heads. They let him do Facebook Home. They, uh, these are major online properties. Facebook is the most popular app, I believe, still in the history of mobile, and they're letting people experiment right on their front page. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, and it'll be, it'll be very interesting to me to see how, uh, you know, what sort of traction this thing has. I, the the thing I just like the most about it is the name. <laughs> I mean, paper, really? There's already other paper things. Well, it was pay Facebook Home and now Facebook Paper. They seem to want really simple one-word names. Yeah, well, its resemblance to Flipboard makes me think that maybe they should have called it Faceboard. <laughs> or, or maybe Flipbook. Flipbook. What's interesting to me, too, uh, is that Facebook Home launched for Android because they couldn't do what they wanted to do on the iPhone. Apple just does not let you take control of the home screen, home screen experience. So they launched Facebook Home for Android. We did get the chat heads in the iOS app. But they also did a partnership with HTC, and they put out a phone that was not Facebook branded, but was HTC branded. There is no Facebook paper phone for Phil Nickinson you know, or 9to5 Google to wake up and review tomorrow. Yeah, interesting, huh? Surprising. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that, too. Maybe a bit surprising. Do you use Facebook, Mark? Do I use Facebook? Yeah. Uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, mostly Facebook Messenger. I don't really stalk people's profiles or anything. Don't really read the news feed. But Messenger is pretty good in terms of lots of people using it. So. 
it's a good product. The thing is that they're, they're social has never been. It's always been migratory. People went from Friendster to MySpace to Facebook. They went from I forget the name of the pre-Twitter client, um, but they went through a lot of microblogging services. And you, you never know how sticky they are. Google Plus, you know, exists now. Uh, the, people have been suggesting that Facebook is m becoming more of your parents' social network and not something the kids use, or maybe the kids just use Messenger. Uh, but I wonder if they're trying to create an experience. I mean, they bought Instapaper. Uh, when I woke up this morning, I actually thought they bought Paper, paper by 53. I, I, before I read the headline, I thought they who bought. Who bought Instapaper? Uh, sorry, Instapaper, uh, Instagram. I apologize. Oh, Instagram. Instas. Right. Not Instacast, oh. not Instapaper, not Insta paper, but Instagram, that's the right Insta. Um, they bought that. I wonder if this is their attempt to stay meaningful and stay uh, important to people, especially in the younger demographic. I kind of, I don't know, actually that's a good point. I don't know how, how many people in the younger demographics really will focus on what paper does in terms of the news gathering um, functionality, but I agree that paper is a move to expand their product line to avoid you know, the whole, it's not an epidemic, but like people saying that it's like, like you said, the parents' social network. That means, you know, making the standalone apps like Messenger, uh, Chat Heads, which I guess you can consider fun. I mean, I think it's useless uh, off of Facebook Home, just in the iOS app, it doesn't really have a point, in my opinion. But it's cool uh, to it's play fantastic with. Fantastic physics. Right, fantastic physics. Um, all the standalone apps, I think, is a big deal. Instagram, of course. And I think with this new policy moving to standalone apps, they're slowly moving away from the dedicated website and news feed. And I think that's how they're going to reinvent themselves over the next five years or so. You know, what's interesting to me, and you know, Mark and I have talked about this before, Peter, but I don't think I've ever asked your take, is Facebook at one point did want to build a phone. They bought Andy Tang over from the Android team. Uh, they, they took all these people out for the, you know, Mark, um, Zuckerberg took these guys out for the Steve Jobs walk. Come to Facebook. We'll help you dent the universe. Uh, and they were going to make a phone. Then they sort of switched gears and made Facebook Home. And now they're not even really, I've heard zero about Facebook Home in the last several months. Now it's back to making apps, which we originally thought they were making so they'd have something to put on their phone when they made it. <laughs> I don't know what their mobile strategy is right now. I don't think anybody knows what their mobile strategy is, and I don't. I don't think Facebook necessarily knows what its mobile strategy is either. For it is, it, it definitely hasn't articulated it to the rest of the world. Um, Facebook seems to be stuck in a rut, you know, in in in, in some respects. But uh, you know, maybe maybe it's a sign of my age, but I do use it a lot. I check it throughout the day, you know, and I stay in touch with a lot of people that way. People in my family, friends. Um, you know, even some business people, I, I, I stay in touch with that way. So Facebook for me is still a very meaningful um, communications channel. Um, I, I hear it's not cool with the kids. You know, Mark himself says that, you know, he doesn't do the whole wall thing. Have your kids blocked you, Peter? Uh, my kids actually, well, only one of my kids is social enough to actually have an account on Facebook. The other two are not into okay, that kind of social media. And he actually has not friended me uh, or his mother. And that's fine with us. That's fine with us. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's been some friction because um, he and his grandmother, my mother, uh, both know some of the same people on Facebook. And he gets <laughs> really offended when she, you know, needles into threads where he's communicating with people that he knows because he feels like it's intrusive. And I actually said to her, you know, when I, we were talking about it a few weeks ago, I said, you know, imagine he's on the playground and he's hanging out with his friends and his grandmother shows up. You know, if imagine... If would have dropped me at the block before we get to the school, Dad, I'll walk the rest of the way. Exactly. I mean, you cool. know, he's almost 14 years old. It's not cool for you and him to be sharing the same space or breathing the same air. So, you know, just stay away from him. So I, that may have a lot to do with why... Um, you know, teens anyway are not necessarily flocking to Facebook like they once did, you know, because it's so well populated with their parents or their uncles and aunts and grandparents that they just don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, we've taken away their second world from them. Now it's as mundane as the first world. Having said that, I have to admit that I didn't friend my parents either for exactly the same reason that he didn't friend me. So I find absolutely no fault in it. Peter, if you're going to go to that concert, wear a sweater. It's chilly outside. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know? 
right. So speaking of mobile strategies that I have no idea what's happening with, uh, Google bought Motorola. Uh, I forget the number. Twelve point five billion dollars. It might have been. Might have been more. Um, they stuck with the, a really terrible roadmap um, for I think a year and a half. Finally, made some really cool phones. The Moto X which wasn't the latest and the greatest speeds and feeds, but was a really great phone, had a lot of amazing innovations like persistent Google Now, always listening, the active notifications on the home screen, you could get teak and bamboo backs on it, and a lot of really cool stuff going on. They also made the Moto G. I mean, you could walk in uh, for a couple hundred bucks, no contract, walk out with a really, you know, not a top-of-the-line phone, but a really, really good phone. Uh, and now they've gone and sold that to Lenovo. And Lenovo already makes phones, but they just don't make very many in North America. They have a really big uh, production facility, production of phones in, sorry, a footprint of phones in China. Um, they were sniffing around BlackBerry for a while. Canadian government said, nope, I'm not going to let you do it. American government said, take Motorola, please, whatever, <laughs> fine. It's all yours. And Google unloaded it. They unloaded it for 3.9 or something, 7, 2 point something million no, two, was it 2.9? Yeah. 2.9 2. billion. Yeah. 2.9 billion dollars. Uh, substantially <laughs> less than they bought it for, but they had already spun off uh, the set-top box business. Um, they'd already made back some money with some of the other rights that they had sold off for it. So it, it's not a huge loss for Google, though I think it's inarguable to say it's a loss. I think they um, traded them for Nest and a Chili's coupon. I, I can't even argue with that. I mean... <laughs> um, you know. Mark, do you, does this mean anything to Apple? I mean, right away last night, articles went up saying this is a threat to Apple, but does right, it really mean yeah. anything to Apple? Apple is the biggest loser here. I forgot who wrote that, <laughs> but that was a headline this morning. No, not judging. Um, yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with Apple. Um, on the, you know, stretching here a little bit, Apple right now is moving to try to dominate some of the emerging markets such as China. Uh, Japan, if you want to call it an emerging market, and Lenovo, like Renee said a couple of minutes ago, that's where their stronghold is right now with smartphones. They're not doing amazing, but it's they don't really have much of a footprint here in North America. It's mostly in China and countries around there. So they get all that technology from Motorola, Motorola X, Moto G, et cetera, et cetera, their resources, their leadership, employees, and Apple's competition in China is probably a little bit tougher, just a little bit. I, but I think that's the extent to the Apple connection here. They did okay with Lenovo, right, Peter? I mean, like, uh, sorry, with ThinkPad. ThinkPad was a Microsoft product. It was business people loved ThinkPad. Uh, Think can't even speak today. Uh, ThinkPad notebooks got sold to Lenovo, and they've done a pretty good line uh, job with that product line. Yeah, and I can't wait to see the red nipple on Droids. You don't need. They got rid of the trackpad on on phones. You don't have them anymore. I don't think. Or on on the ThinkPads. Yeah. Um. You, you know, they they have. You know, I can't fault uh, Lenovo for their track record. They they make a they make a quality product, and I know that a lot of people were concerned about that when they bought the ThinkPad line from IBM. You know, the 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 perspective at the time was this is disastrous. You know, this cheap Taiwanese manufacturer is is going to you know take these business machines that we've loved for years and turn them into complete crap and they really haven't they've managed to maintain the brand uh, you know they've continued to innovate they've continued to uh, to develop some nice products and they've diversified it too uh, so it'll be very interesting to see what direction they take uh, Motorola mobility mobilities products in what I found interesting is oh, sorry Benjamin Kindle in the chat room is saying he really hopes they spit out a Moto X2 and a Moto G2 um, that they continue that product line. That's a big question mark to me because this was Google's hardware division. As much as you know, they said we're going to keep it at arm's length and all of that, they were putting out Google phones. The Motorola X was a great Google phone. In terms of experience, it was better than the Nexus 5. Nexus 5, much better screen, better specs, but the overall experience of a Nexus X of a Moto X was way better than the Nexus line. And now it's not clear to me where Google goes for hardware. Is Tony Fidel going to become the hardware czar at Google? Mark, are we going to see a Nest phone of all things? Yeah, so now that you've put that in perspective, it might be a little bit scary for Apple. Tony Fidel, Matt Rogers, whatever his name is, and three, uh, 200, etc., or 300 oh, other geez. guys who used to work for Apple on the iPhone, iPad, iPod, and who knows what, now becoming Google's hardware division. That's pretty scary. It's like Apple versus a smaller Apple now. It could get ugly. I don't know. There's, there was a report last night that uh, from TechCrunch that 
that's what Fidel and the Nest team are going to do now, work on hardware outside of the home appliances, could include phones. We'll have to see. I mean, that's not going to pose anything for at least two or three years from now. So I think in, if we're having this conversation in two years, it's going to be a bit different. Uh, I don't know if we will have this conversation in two years, though, to be honest. But. No, it'll be. I mean, it is interesting because no, no, yeah. Tony Tony Fidel uh, was the one who wanted to have a Linux phone with a with a spin wheel dialer. No, not really, but really, um, you know, a click wheel dialer, sort sort of, and lost that argument to Scott Forrestal uh, and the o, the OS ten, you know, Bertrand Serlet and the OS ten team. But he has serious hardware chops, and Google didn't really have that. I mean, Andy Rubin, fantastic hard, hard uh, software guy. Sanjay, I forget his, uh, I forget Control. the man. He oh, yeah. took over. Um, Android also runs uh, Chrome OS. Fantastic guy. They did not have serious hardware smarts, and they do. And it's still not clear to me that Apple could buy someone with serious server smarts the way that Google seems to keep buying designers, developers, and uh, product people. Unless Bertrand Serlet's up there is for sale, is it? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> Peter, I, I, I don't think personally, that, like Mark said, that it's going to be a couple years. Whatever device Google manages to put out, if they decide, I mean, they've had a successful partnership with um, Samsung and LG and HTC making these Nexus devices. Uh, they just struck a big deal, a cross-patent license deal with Samsung. Some people believe... Uh, conspiracy hat time. The part of the agreement was Samsung saying, you guys can't be owning Motorola anymore. If you want us to stop dicking around with Android uh, to be friendly, then you've got to stop you know, doing your stuff on the side. Uh, so Samsung's still a big partner with Google, closer partner than ever. But it's going to matter what phones they can put on the table. It'll be you know, iPhone 6, iPhone 6S time. Uh, by, the, by the time we probably see anything new coming from either of these things, and that, that, I think that is when it's going to matter. Yeah, and that's assuming that um, Motorola Mobility's uh, hardware roadmap isn't disrupted uh, by this change in ownership. Uh, have, do, do we know anything about that? Have either company said uh, anything about uh, what's going to happen as far as that's concerned? I know I that there's. They said that they mentioned the roadmap. I don't know. I think they're continuing the existing roadmap, but you never know what people say in an acquisition what actually happens. And what actually happens. Plus, it's going to take some time for that acquisition to actually happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, regardless of what happens, that's not going to impact Apple's um, uh, roadmap for its own products. Those products are going to come out in whatever due time Apple wants them to, whether it's June or October or whenever. Uh, you know, Apple's going to have some uh, uh, so, some new stuff out this year, just like they do every year. They have to. They have to, you know, keep pace with what's happening in the industry, and they've got to get people excited about buying new products. Yeah, that's one of the things I've been like. And Mark, I think you'll appreciate this. I mean, a Apple's going to make a new phone this year. They're not going out of business. It's their most profitable profit line. It makes me laugh when I see stories like Apple's going to make a new phone this year. You know, the news would be if they stopped, if they actually shut the doors and went out of business. That'd be the big news. One day, one day, we'll see. <laughs> one day. If they're going to keep keep with these uh, four inch screens and not move with the market and stick to their whatever reasoning they have for these small screens, it's going to be about time until they get crushed by Samsung. Even so more. I've heard they're doing a bigger screen this year. I did not hear they're doing two. I know there was a Wall Street Journal article saying that it might be up to two inches or one of them and might Bloomberg. be for the future. Bloomberg. Yeah, Bloomberg. I've only heard there's one. I've heard there's, they're working on one larger screen phone. and mm -hmm. that, But I've always heard it was this year. I never heard that it was last year. This year, because you know they have their cycle. They had the 5. They have 5S was already there. This yep. was going to be the year of the larger phone. And it makes sense to me because... Uh, not necessarily because other people do smart do larger screens because so far I think 41% of the phones they said in North in, in America were sold last year were the iPhones which meant that not only did people pick them over a large screen phone but over all large screen phones so I think the base there is still strong but it's not growing anymore and you know once upon a time Apple had the iPhone on AT&T and people would actually leave their carrier and go to AT&T but it came a point in time when everybody who would or could be on AT&T had that iPhone and the growth would not go forward. So the Verizon iPhone deal happened, and then people no longer had to choose between AT&T and iPhone or Verizon. They could choose the iPhone on Verizon and increase their addressable market considerably. And I think we have that situation today where people are choosing between the iPhone and a larger screen device, primarily Samsung right now. And some of those people might want iOS, might be used to iOS, but they need a larger screen. Maybe it's their only computing device. You know, they, they don't want to carry a tablet or a laptop and they want to be able to do more with it. Maybe it's for accessibility because they're older and they want to have a larger screen in front of them where they're younger and they want to watch more video or play more games. And if Apple 
Apple has shown last year they can do two phones in a year. So if this year, if they have the 4-inch and they have the 4.3 to 5-inch screen, uh, that means people can choose iOS on a larger screen. And that, once again, if their market was like the circular Venn diagram, they've now increased that diagram to more potential customers. And it's still high-end. Like Those are still high-end premium phones. And Apple would be extremely foolish not to go after that uh, piece of the pie. Um, I'm concerned that they won't do it because they seem not to be innovating much lately. But I think... Uh, yeah, I think they'll do it. But I don't think it's going to be like 4.3 or 4.5. I think they're going to go closer to 5 or 4.7 or 4.8 because I, I don't know. I haven't done the math, but there's all sorts of variables that go into this. Do they ex expand the screen resolution? Do they do this? Do they do that? I'm sure Renee will have something on this. I did. Uh, I wrote it last January. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Uh, well, that's the thing is that they could increase, if they increase the size of the iPhone now to 5 inches, you get the same pixel density as the iPad Retina. Um, which they know how to make, right, 264 right. pixels per inch. Uh, at an iPhone distance, it's not exactly Retina, but Retina is a marketing term. They can make it mean anything they want to make it mean. Yeah. I mean, Personally, I'd like more pixels. I think that's all. I think the problem isn't just the size. I think the size is one problem, but I would like more pixels on the device now. And Apple, Apple has done this stutter step. Like they went to Retina with the iPhone 4, which they increased the pixel density. Then the iPhone 5 increased the amount of pixels because they went to 16 by 9. They added, uh, they went from 940 to 1130. Was it 960 to 1136? And that actually increased. And so every two years, developers get a little bit of pain. So if the screen increases again and they add a little bit more pixels again, they can letterbox the stuff that's not ready yet. It's ugly, but it shames developers into doing it. But we'll get not only um, a bigger screen, but a higher density screen. I don't know if that's 1080p or not. Like Gruber says, he won't believe the rumors until someone puts a pixel density. I think Seth was one of the Seth Weintraub on Mac was one of the first ones to get the 1136. Yeah, um, two he, years ago. He got, he got that first. So until someone gets that density, it's hard. But that makes so much sense to me. Uh, and Donald Trump was saying, "Oh, if Steve Jobs were alive, he'd be rolling in his grave because he would, you know, they haven't done a larger screen." No, Who's Steve Jobs. Was Damn what he thinks. If Steve Jobs was alive, you would never get a larger screen. You would not have gotten some of the stuff you already gotten. Um, you'd have a skew-morphic small screen, and you'd like it. <laughs> Sorry, Peter, you were going to say something? No. Oh, we lost Peter. Peter's cutting out. Donald Trump heard him and shut down the internet. <laughs> Donald Trump shut down. Uh, so, my, I mean, it sounds like you would like a larger screen iPhone at this point, too. Yeah, for sure. And about the, the app thing, that's a, that's going to be a uh, a major not issue, a component of moving to the bigger screen and new resolution. So I think that okay. So like the people who will be bothered by the problems with the screen not matching the app sizes are going to be like the everyday consumers. But like the everyday consumers are the ones dedicated to like the Twitter app, the Facebook app, Candy Crush. Right. And those developers, they are going to like we've seen when the iPad went retina, when the uh, iPhone went 4-inch, when the iPhone went retina, the developers of the mainstream apps that are getting hundreds of thousands of downloads a day, they're going to get their apps reformatted very, very quickly. So I, I don't think that's going to be a problem for the, for, the, uh, for the major developers. I think the problem um, is going to lie with some of the small guys who might not have the resources to redo the graphics, redo their UIs. But I think overall it's going to be a pretty seamless transition, and I think I think customers are going to really going to be happy, and I think it's going to be a really good move for Apple because they're not only going to be going after the people who want the iPhone because of iOS right now with the foreign screen, but they're going to be attracting people from who would have bought in the Samsung or from yeah, it hurts Samsung too. The bigger screen, so I think this is going to be a great move, and it's a good year to do it. So. Yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, Logan Westman in the chat room says, how mad, though, will developers be about the new screen size? Apple cares about Apple first, then about customer experience, and then a list of... Originally, it was Apple cared what Steve Jobs liked, and then about, you know, what was good for Apple. Now it's generally Apple cares about what's good for Apple, then, you know, what's good for their customers, a long list of things, and then developers. I mean, they, were, they love developers, but they're never going to let anybody, even their customers, they've shown, hold back what they consider to be the development of their platform. iOS 7, uh, to Mark's point before, you saw who cared about their apps by who updated for iOS 7 quickly, and there was a lot of comments that if you didn't update for iOS 7, you're basically throwing your app away, and two years earlier, it was if you didn't update for the long screen, you're basically throwing your app away. I don't know if they might scale up the phone this year and then increase the pixel count next year or the year after, if they're going to do it in stages to make it easier. 
but it's going to happen eventually. We we won't have a four inch nine you know six forty by nine sixty sorry six forty by eleven thirty six phone in four years from now, will we, Peter? We we won't have a what? I'm sorry. I said like I don't like the iPhone is just never going to be static. Four years from now, the, oh. the iPhone is going to be different. Well, I think that that there there will be a continuity. You know, there's a continuum now. You know, we the 4S is still an, an active thing. People will still go out and buy it. But um, I, for Apple not to innovate, you know, what what is by any measure its crown product right now is ridiculous to consider. You know, they're going to keep they're going to keep putting money into it. But they have to be careful. You know, they can't scare people too much with something that's radically different than before. You know, a triangle phone. Well, yeah, a curved triangle phone, right? You know, innovation for Apple is is never about disruption. Is never well, it, it results in disruption, but it's never about the creation of, of of completely new markets just for new markets' sake. You know, it's it's understanding how people are using the things that they're doing and figuring out better ways to bring that experience to them. Um, and you know this is no different for the iPhone than it is for any other product. So it's an iterative process. You know that you can compare a new iPhone, an iPhone 5s, let's say, um, to to a, 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 a the original iPhone, the very first iPhone, and you're going to know. You know if 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 you only know the original iPhone, you're going to know immediately when you've got that iPhone 5s in your hand what it is and essentially how it works you know because the interface may have changed its look may have changed its feel a little bit but it's still fundamentally the same user experience uh, you know there's an interesting parallel to draw here last friday was apple's uh, that was the 30th anniversary of the macintosh and you know as different as the macintosh is today you know big screens color uh, Unix underpinnings, very sophisticated UI. You can take somebody who's only ever used Mavericks and drop them in front of a Macintosh, and they're going to know what to do. There is a continuity there over the 30 years of user experience. There's still a file menu. There's still an edit menu. Um, you know, there, there's there there are these things that people will recognize. Uh, over the course of that 30 years, that marks it as an evolutionary experience as opposed to something completely, some mutation, some complete change. So, yeah, I, I, th I don't think that the, the, uh, the iPhone will ever be a ship in a bottle, um, but, but I think that the, there's going to be continuity, absolutely, throughout the product's life. I agree. I, I mean, there's things I would like to see. Well, first, I mean, that, that interests me on, on so many levels, uh, and I asked this on MacBreak. Can we see a 30th anniversary of the iPhone party, the same way we saw a 30th anniversary of the Mac, or will this product change so quickly that Benedict Evans, really, really smart analyst, uh, put up a thing saying, it's impossible to predict the market for mobile because it changes so fast, and in five years from now, he has no idea what it will mean to install an app on an Android phone because it could mean something totally different than a does today in such a short period of time. Um, and I know there's things I'd like to see in an iPhone 6. Uh, there was a rumor that it was going to be 6 millimeters thin, and Apple certainly loves their thinness. I actually hope that they don't go that extreme. I'd like longer battery life. I think battery, we've gotten to the same point with phones that we have with computers at battery life, that, the, that they're fast enough and they're thin enough, and I would like longer battery life now. I'd like them to be able to fit a thicker camera in there so that they can get greater Z-index, Z Z-index in America, and you know start tackling Nokia. Apple does great camera after capture. I'd love to see them do great camera in front of the capture, just optical image stabilization, a really good you know, Zeiss quality lens, all those kind of things. There's so much room for things that they could still do with the platform, I think, especially now if they're willing to be a little, I don't know what the right word is, um, audacious about it. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, I think that, uh, you know, the, the things that, uh, you know, the, the funny thing is, I, I, what exactly do we need out of our device, though? I mean, they, you know, well, let's face it, we, the three of us, and for many of the people who are listening, uh, watching us, they're going to get. We're all going to get the new device when it comes out. We're all going to be the first kids on our block with the new hotness because that's how we are. We're very wired to be early adopters for this stuff. But what will drive the public, you know, to get excited um, about the iPhone? You know, built-in espresso what, maker. Hmm. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> SodaStream. 
I have to apologize because Mark Gurman is frozen at the moment. So we're going to wait for him to rejoin us. But I think that's true, Peter. I mean, you look at the iPhone 5S and you look at the iPad Air, uh, you look at the new Mac Pro and they're phenomenal machines that seem, and every year they could make them faster, they could maybe make them a little thinner, they could put more memory in them. Um, but that's that's the present technology, and I'm really interested in seeing what could happen next with all these devices. Indeed, and there's been a lot of talk just in the last day or so about how Apple is really, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're they're putting the uh, the the pedal to the metal to try to open um, a facility in Arizona to build more sapphire glass. Um, which will, of course, yield more Touch ID sensors, which we'll see, um, you know, across Apple's product line. I don't ever want to have to type in a password again. I just want to be able to use my fingerprint for everything. So, I mean, there's two, there's two really interesting lines of questioning there. One is there's been a lot of talk about an iPad Pro, a 13-inch version of the iPad. And I can see an iPad Pro from some angles. Like, you know, you could, again, have greater pixel size, which would benefit creative types, um, people in productivity industries. I know Mark Edwards wants one for both music and design. Can't Certainly can't blame him. Maybe you could put a digitizer in it so that you'd have Wacom-like um, pressure sensitivity. But... I still see that being very different in kind from a MacBook Air style device. I would never go, I love the iPad mini, but if I'm getting a 13-inch device, it's going to be a, a Mac still. You know, that's a really good point. And when I first got my, my iPad, I got my iPad in April of 2010 when they first came out. And for months afterwards, I tried to figure out how I was going to put this into my workflow. And I knew that I knew I wanted to use it as a mobile data device, but I wasn't quite sure how. And as soon as companies started rolling out um, typewriter, or I mean, uh, uh, keyboard uh, 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 cases for them, I tried them. I tried pretty much all of them, and I was never really happy. This one didn't fit right. This one didn't feel right. This one has a funny edge on it that uh, hurts my wrists when I type. This one's, um, uh, you know, key reflex is really soft and mushy or whatever it was. It just, it, it was never the right thing. And it was funny because I guess I was living in a bit of a vacuum at the time because I remember going to um, uh, Macworld Expo that uh, January or February, whenever it was in 2011, and seeing in the press room, almost everybody in the press room was using a MacBook Air. And it was like, you know, the, the old V8 ads where, you know, you smack yourself on the head and say, I could have had a V8. It's like, oh, I've been trying to get my iPad to do what I needed a MacBook Air to do all along. I was looking for something light. I was looking for something portable. I was looking for something with a screen about this size. Uh, but I, I wanted the full functionality of a Mac. An iPad Pro doesn't interest me in any way, shape, or form. I don't see the iPad as a Pro device. You know, it's it's a good device to 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 uh, to interact with for a lot of different things. Maybe there's a market for it if for certain segments like artists. But it's a pro market, example. right? I mean, that's the difference to me is that it does. A, a large iPhone sells tons more iPhones to me, but a large iPad only sells a niche amount more iPads. It's it's a niche amount exactly, and I'm not sure that Apple is really interested in dealing with niches when we're talking about their manufacturing and their. Uh, their, their marketing plans. You know, I don't really see that as a compelling reason for them to do an iPad Pro either. So I, the iPad Pro just doesn't make much sense to me. It, I, I would tell people, as a matter of fact, I tell people every weekend who come in comparing the iPad and the MacBook Pro or the MacBook Air, you know, what are you going to use it for? Are you going to do a lot of typing? You know, are you going to do a lot of data entry? Then you need a Mac. You don't need an iPad. It's going to drive you crazy. You know, so I, this is a natural sort of thought process that a lot of people go through, but um, I think you have to take them by the hand sometimes and explain to them, you know, the iPad just isn't necessarily good for everything. It's not a general that. purpose computer. And I love the screwdriver, and you can hammer nails with a screwdriver, but it's not the optimal experience. It's not the optimal experience at all. So while we have Mark back... Um, Sorry about just, that. No, no worries. I blame Hangouts for everything. No, um, it's my internet. I don't know what happened. Just... So one of the other products Apple hasn't updated in a while is the Apple TV. It was last updated at the iPad 3 event in March or April of 2012. Uh, it had a tiny update when they changed to a single socket uh, die shrunk A5, I believe, uh, when they stopped using the discarded ones and went with their own dedicated chip. That was not user-facing at all. Um, 
we've been hearing for a while, at least you know, if, you, if you knew where to look, they've been putting really smart software engineers on the Apple TV team. Um, they're not going to waste that kind of talent. Uh, there was talk of an SDK. You guys had a story up about how Bloomberg made their app, but there's been talk for a while. Uh, developers have been talking to Apple for a while about an SDK, but it was still sitting up on bricks in the parking lot at Cupertino, not really going anywhere. Uh, and if you do have an SDK, it's not probably going to run on a single core A5 with 8 gigabytes of NAND flash uh, you know, storage. Um, so, Mark, you, you wrote a piece this week about the Apple TV might finally be getting... We might finally see the fruits of all this labor. Right. So what uh, I reported is that Apple's been working on a new version of the Apple TV that uh, new hardware, new software, uh, revamped inside and out, um, new internals, and there's been some prototyping going on inside Apple of a version of this next-generation Apple TV that has an integrated airport express base station in it. Uh, 802.11ac, I believe, and that would allow Apple to hook, you know, you would be able to, the Wi-Fi and everything would be in one box, so Apple would be able to dedicate certain streams to the Apple TV, which would make uh, streaming content from their servers more reliable, um, and all sorts of improvements for AirPlay and over the air, over a Wi-Fi, you know, ways of controlling the product. So if that actually ships, I think that's going to be a big deal. Uh, also, a integrated TV synthesizer and tuner component. So that would be sort of like the failed Google TV, which would allow Apple to hook into your existing cable boxes and put an Apple trademark user interface over that. And I think that could improve the TV experience for a lot of people. Now, it sounds like this uh, new Apple TV is coming very soon, potentially in the first half of this year. Of course, manufacturing and software engineering issues can push it back, but it really sounds like 2014 is the year that this is going to happen. There haven't been rumblings like this in, in previous years of a new version of the Apple TV coming out. So I think there's a lot of strong indicators that it, it's, it's happening. So I have three questions, only one of which is serious. First, is it going to come in gold? Is that the serious one? No. Um, all, is this going to finally shut Gene Munster up? It's also not serious. No, no, no. <laughs> I didn't mention that. Uh, thanks for reminding me. It it's, sounds like it's going to be a set-top box, so a, either a replacement or an addition to the existing box, but it doesn't sound like it's going to be a screen. So, I mean, like, that makes a lot of sense. If you're not an analyst, that makes an incredible amount of sense because, uh, you know, Apple can, can screw around with their 4K display. And I want to say screw around because 4K display is, is still an amorphous business. There are 4K televisions. There are 4K displays. Um, an ideal product for me from Apple would be if they just finish their 4K cinema display and you can hook an Apple TV up to that if you choose to. No, they are but working not, on one of those, too, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if, but if you if you are not someone who needs to buy a 4K Apple panel, I mean that's a really small audience to sell to. Uh, the box makes so much more sense because anyone with any panel can just hook that box up. Sort of like iOS in the car versus embedded Microsoft Sync. Right, and it fits the whole Apple uh, philosophy of you know selling a new version of a product each year that they're going to want people to run out and buy. We've had this discussion too many times, to be honest, but people are not going to buy a new three, $4,000 TV every year, too. So. Not every, not, they would not even buy, I mean, even an iPad, you'll keep two, three years. A TV, probably, it was five, seven, ten years. Fifteen, uh, twenty. Low margin business, yeah. high technology yeah. changes faster than the market. Yeah, for so many pain points, if you're not an analyst, this is very clear to you. Um, the things that interest me about this is, you know, we've, there were, Someone who'd worked on the actual Apple, current Apple TV interface said that Steve Jobs hadn't liked it and had basically canned it. Uh, and then it came back to sort of... It's, it's okay. It's a serviceable interface. It's a bit clogged right now. You can't do a lot of things. You can't search across content. I can't type in something and see if it's on Netflix or on Crunchyroll or on iTunes. You don't have to go to every separate service and search, which is not a great experience. But the point that was interesting is the Google television one because that made the networks lose their minds when Google tried to overwrite their interface. And I wonder if Apple's going to do that, because Google just did it. I wonder if Apple's going to use EDQ and those sort of deals and relationships they have to sort of offer it as a value add to the studios and go with them instead of trying to do an end run around them. I'll tell you what, here's my opinion on that. Steve Jobs would do it and not say anything and not care what they think. Uh, EDQ might do the same. But I think that if they were going to go the EDQ hammer the negotiations out route, 
this would not be the product that's shipping. I think the product that would ship if they were able to strike the deals would be ones where you didn't need the cable box. You were able to get all your content a la carte from every network provider. But you know what? Doing that across the whole world or even the United States is probably it. It's, it I don't know. I'm not in that industry. It's as but unworkable today as it was when Steve Jobs explained why it was unworkable in all things D. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> And I think the Google TV route with the TV synthesizer component hooking up to those cable boxes is a very real solution and a real compromise that I think is feasible both on the technical side and on the legal side, dealing with the networks. So I think it's a good halfway step in the mind of Apple, but the consumers aren't really going to see a difference because it's going to be the same. It's just, it's just the back-end stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, I cut the cord, so I don't have a cable box anymore, but before I cut the cord, my scientific Atlanta box, and Peter, I think you can sympathize with me on this, was the same as it had been for the previous 10 years. I went from having uh, no smartphone to having a trio to having an iPhone 5, and that cable box did not change at all. It was still squared SD menus with the horrible interface. Uh, so any innovation that anybody can do in that space, I think, is tremendous. Yeah, you know, I, I guess things have, things have been a little bit different for me, you know, in that I have had a lot of problems with my set-top boxes uh, with, with, uh, with Comcast, who's my cable provider, who I still use. So I ended up sort of just avoiding them altogether. I ended up getting a cable card from them, and I went with a TiVo box. And, uh, you know, I, I subscribe to TiVo. I've got a TiVo box sitting in my living room. I love it. I infinitely prefer the interface. So... I've kind of gone the, 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 the Mac route of the road less traveled for, uh, for set-top boxes. Um, you and Syracuse. Right, yeah. You know, having said that, it's, it's a market that is ripe for change. And I, I, the Apple TV in its current incarnation is not the product to do that. You know, not without serious changes. Not, not just to the, the box itself, but to the way the content is provided. Um, and, and that is a market that has been very, very slow um, to respond to uh, consumer needs, and it's been a, a, company, or a, a market that's also very hostile to encroachment from Apple. So at the end of the day, I think I'm a little pessimistic about Apple's chances for really shaking things up there, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. My, uh, Mark, you remember that in the Isaacson book when they said when Steve Jobs said he'd cracked the interface? And I always wondered, you know, was he saying that or was that sort of like Furman's last theorem where he's just going to leave it squiggled in the margin to drive everyone crazy after he's gone? But there, <laughs> that interface really needs to be... I'm, I have yet to see a good cross-media interface. Like, it's certainly not Sony's crossbar. Microsoft Xbox is good. I mean, I've had Xbox Media Center, but they kind of ruined that in the Xbox One because it no longer has the Media Center extenders. I, I would like Apple to succeed in this area. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice if they did something cool. I mean, I think the interface is going to be completely new, iOS-y. I mean, the problem is the clutter. Um, in terms of them adding content on a rapid pace, it's difficult to organize. And you said the general search bar. So I think it might look a little more like iOS, have like a spotlight pull down, bigger icons, that type of thing, like a carousel maybe. Um, but yeah, I agree. It needs to change. Uh, so the thing that still, to me, that has to be solved, the interface absolutely. I mean, the original one, I think it ran Summerboard, right? The, uh, on iOS instead of Springboard. It would be the whole thing was Springboard and it has web apps on it. I forget the... It's architecturally strange um, and limiting, and that needs to be fixed. But it's unclear to me how you get people to control it. I mean, uh, people can have their dreams of Siri and connect, like, prime sense visual recognizers, but you need something. That little aluminum controller is going to hit a brick wall at a certain point in terms of functionality. Is it realistic to expect everyone to buy an iPhone? Is the iPod touchline so broken now that they could just throw one in the box with every new Apple TV? Uh, it, you know, are, will you have to have an iPad? How I interface, because it's, t it's 10 feet away, it's a big screen, it's not pixel perfect because you cannot count on stupid overscans and stuff like that on uh, TV boxes. It's going to have to have something that I can control well to, I think, be that experience. Yeah, I think that it's going to be heavily reliant upon the iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch. It won't come with one of those, but I think the experience will be greatly 
enhanced if you have one of those. You won't even come with an HDMI cable. Who am I kidding? Right, 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 right. You're lucky if it comes in a box <laughs> instead of, like, plastic wrap. Um, but, yeah, I think it's going to be heavily reliant on existing iOS devices. I know for a fact they have been working on motion controls for this. I don't know if it's going to be in this year's incarnation, three years down the road. I don't know. But it's something they're thinking about. Siri 2. Um, well, that was the Mac project. I mean, they, they've had projects, because they don't believe at all in capacitive touch on large displays, but they do believe in de- uh, gestures, like air base gestures. So sort of like if, you know, waving your hands and doing motion-based control. Mm. Right, 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 right. So that would so, be good across TVs and Mac lines, potentially. That would be interesting. It could be their next big insight into uh, how to control. Well, so here's uh, the thing. Uh, Siri made microphones smarter. Before that, all microphones were dumb. Uh, voice control wasn't much better, but you would just talk. But Siri put sequential inference and contextual understanding and all these things that makes a microphone actually intelligent. And they've been working on that with cameras for a while. Prime Sense helps with that a little bit. But if the camera, if your eyesight camera becomes a smart, not like in terms of a smartphone, it's still a dumb sensor, but can do a lot more processing on the A7, uh, A8 or whatever it is that comes in there, then I think that becomes really interesting. I totally agree. I think that it's a hardware and software integration play like everything that Apple does. So I think one is going to balance the other for a great user experience. It's just about the timing when Apple's ready to put it to market, as always with Apple. I mean, we're not talking about Google here. <laughs> you know, Apple, you know, they could have showed whatever they're coming out with this year. They could have showed it two years ago. And, you know, people waiting for two years. But Apple doesn't roll that way. So. They're very, I mean, they work three to four years ahead. So, like, they yeah. somewhere in Cupertino, there, there's a circuit board for an iPhone 7 or 8 or whatever it is. Um, but they're patient. They just wait. And I like I like that both Samsung and, and Apple uh, exist in this world. I like that I can see this crazy uncle, and I've said this before, throw out every imaginable permutation of technology because some of them will stick. There'll be 99% I don't use and 1% that'll go, hey, I'd really like that. And I think that helps us get the future faster. But I think that Apple's approach makes sure that we have usable incremental products year after year. And while it's not as revolutionary as the iPhone might have been in 2007, when you look, and I think Peter said this earlier, when you look at an iPhone 5S now, it's amazing how far they've come. Yeah. Yeah. It is pretty amazing. I mean, this is the iPhone 7. So. Having said that, the rest yeah. of the industry hasn't been sitting still either. You what? know, I'm... What? Seriously? Yeah. Well, you know, there it is. I mean, you know, the, the rest of the industry hasn't been sitting so, still either. So, uh, you know, as, uh, as, as much as those changes have happened, you know, uh, it, it, a lot of our friends who use Android phones were the, were the first to, to say, hey, you know, some of these things in iOS 7 that you're, uh, uh, that you're gawking about right now are things that we've had for a while. You know, Apple's, uh, Apple's got to stay on the treadmill. I agree that completely. A couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, David um, David Barnard, a Launch Center Pro, he's updated that. He's made a version for the iPad now too. Uh, Launch Center Pro, if you're not familiar with it, it lets you do actions, not just icons. So instead of just tapping a button and launching an app, you can tap it and, and message Mark or tap it and add an item onto OmniFocus. It's a really good, fast. There's, there's iOS doesn't do a lot of things that stuff like Android does do, but this app helps you do a lot of those sort of things. It uses UR, um, URL schemes and, and callbacks and stuff. Very clever. Um, Hype, Ryan Nielsen, and um, Jonathan Deutsch, both former Apple employees, incredibly smart guys. Hype is like what Flash should have been, an HTML5 animation and dynamic inter- interaction creator. They've just got a new version. It's totally, uh, what's the fancy word now, Peter, on the internet when things resize magically? Um, oh, um, responsive. Uh, responsive design, yeah. Yeah, responsive design, and you saw this new version of Ember out, I think, too. That's right. Yes, the new version of Ember from uh, Real Mac Software. Very cool uh, scrapbooking app, and I don't mean scrapbooking like um, you know cutting things out and putting them on paper and then putting doilies <laughs> around them. You know, this is this is an industrial strength app for content creators who need to. Um, uh, gather uh, material for what they're working on, whether it's prototyping or uh, inspiration for projects or whatever, but images, web pages, 
videos, whatever, a really good collection tool. It's what Little Snapper used to be. If you remember Real Max Little Snapper, uh, Ember is uh, Little Snapper renamed and given uh, a really big um, steroid injection. Uh, just came out with new versions for both iOS and Mac. Definitely worth checking out. And you also tried to tease me with more Shadowrun today. Yes, Dragonfall. Dragonfall is going to be coming, um, I think, the third week in February. It's the first official expansion pack for Shadowrun, uh, Shadowrun Returns, which came out last year. Um, the uh, um, uh, sort of updated version of a tabletop uh, um, uh, role-playing game that, that uh, uh, was originally developed by uh, FASA Corp. Um, Hairbrain Schemes uh, came out with a tactical RPG, a tactical role-playing game last year uh, based on Shadowrun. Very cool, uh, futuristic cyberpunk world where nanotechnology exists and everybody uses it. And, oh, by the way, there are elves and orcs and dwarves and shit. It's very neat. It's like Blade Runner meets, uh, meets Neuromancer meets Dungeons and Dragons. Exactly, exactly. Mark, I know you're not a huge app guy, but is there anything you're using lately? No, uh... I'll take a look. <laughs> Nothing new that I know off the top of my head. I mean, still using things. Oh yes, things. I am. I am addicted to things. It's really helped me get organized. It's it's expensive when you buy all the apps on the Mac, iPad plus iPhone. But if you really want to get your stuff together, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And I'm looking forward to their iOS 7 update, which should be coming out in the next few months. So check it out. Awesome. All right, Mac. Oh, sorry, Mark. I was about to say Mac. Uh, 9 to 5 Mac. But Mark from 9 to 5 Mac. Um, if people want to follow more of your writings, they can go to 9 to 5 Mac. If they want to talk to you personally on Twitter, where can they go? Uh, at Mark German, which is my name. So nice. uh, that's my Twitter handle. Um, yeah. Where can they find you, Renee? They can find me at Renee Ritchie. Thank you for asking. Sure. And I bet they can find you someplace too, Peter. Yes, at Flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H, because I'm apparently more imaginative than you guys are when it comes to usernames on, on Twitter. Not uh, all of us can be named after a kaiju, okay? That's right. <laughs> well, you don't know my uh, AIM name, so uh, I do um, there. Yeah. I do. <laughs> I do know that. <laughs> I'm not going to spill the beans. You have, to, you, have to, you have to figure it out on your own. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we can find Mark every week on 9 to 5 Mac, just killing it. I think... Is it safe to say last year was your best year ever? Uh, yeah. I think you nailed pretty much everything. Perhaps. Um, did, a, did a good job. I think this year will be bigger, though. We'll see. All right. Apple better not disappoint you, Mark. No. <laughs> Peter, uh, anything coming up from you? I know Oh, you're going to start a new project series for us. Is that right? That is correct. You know, the Mac makes uh, a great uh, media server, uh, but there are some tips, tricks, and techniques that you can use to really make it an awesome one. So uh, you're, you're going to be seeing that from me uh, in fairly short order. Awesome. Uh, friend of the show, Vicki Murley, formerly Safari uh, evangelist at Apple, current author, has started her Kickstarter today. She did a fantastic book called CSS Transforms, and she is following it up with a new book called CSS Animations, and she's Kickstartering it. I'm going to put the link in there. Uh, if there is so much awesome. It's like if you just think of taking core animation um, and uh, you know the canvas element, you put all this stuff together and do it on the web uh, and in style. Um, make sure you check that out. Guys, thank you so much. It, it, chat room, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching live. We are here every Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If you can watch us live, that's the best thing because you can interact with us in the chat room. Oh, I forgot. We had a couple questions. Let me just quickly... How do you delete saved iMessages data? I have 1.1 gigabytes of space and I can't seem to get rid of it. That's from Mike Reed. I call this the Casey List problem. If you want to save your messages, you'll have to get something like Ecamm's um, phone viewer, and then you can download all of your messages. You can actually go through and print them out as a PDF uh, if you want to, and you can store them on a machine that is bigger than your iPhone that runs out of... Do you do a lot of... Do you do like three gigs worth of text, Peter? I have a lot of texts, but I've got a 32-gig phone, so... And I don't keep a lot of apps on there, so I have no idea offhand how much is it's taking up. Rob Rickman wants to know if we could see two new iPhones released at different times this year. 
I, I, you know, I think there'll be two new iPhones because Apple's going to have the flagship and they're going to have the flagship minus $100. They've had those two slots for a long time. They've had the iPhone 5S and 5C in them this year. Last year they had the 5 and the 4S, which weren't new, but they're still in those slots. If Apple goes to a 6-inch phone for the, sorry, 5-inch phone for the flagship, keeping the 5S around, they could do that, but I think they prefer having the easier-to-manufacture model I don't know if that becomes a 5S, 5CS, or that becomes a 5.6S. I don't think they'll be at separate times, though. I mean, I think that the Christmas... I don't know, you have a feeling on that, Mark? I think Apple's all in on iPhones in the Christmas quarter. Yeah, I mean, they wouldn't have made the major investment that they did to be able to move the phones to the fall just to do that for a year or two. So, and I also, I mean, they're doing stuff as soon as it's ready, like the Mac Pro shipment and the iPad Retina Mini shipments were not late right. because Apple was just, I mean, they put those things out as fast as they could get them ready. Right. They've been trying to get those out sooner, weren't ready. I mean, remember how many products they ha- they, they're they they developing and producing each year. I mean, a lot of stuff to uh, manufacture, a lot of time needed to make enough for launch dates. It's complex behind the scenes, so yeah, nice. I agree there. I'm going to throw this one at you, Peter. Why doesn't, I match, why doesn't iTunes match download what I want, where I want, with the album art I want it to? Oh, my God. <laughs> Don't even get me started on iTunes match. I've had more problems with it, um, with, with my own library as well. I had to try to rebuild my library once uh, using iTunes match and uh, ran into a whole host of, of trouble. Uh, you know, that's a really good question, and I don't think Apple's really answered it satisfactorily. Um, sometimes it just seems really arbitrary. Sometimes um, you'll you'll get your 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 music, but you won't get your album art. And uh, other times you'll have one track that's just stuck out there in cyberspace, and there's no way to download it. It's the most frustrating thing. Having said that, it's a service that I'm mostly happy with, so I continue to subscribe to it. But every so often, something makes me want to choke iTunes matches scrawny little neck. <laughs> Mark, what do you use for your music these days? Uh, I just use iTunes. iTunes match, I agree with Peter. It's, it's useless. I never know when it's working. I never know when it's not working. I, I don't know what's going on. I just know I'm paying for it. <laughs> do you use iTunes radio? Sometimes, sometimes. I don't I don't think it's amazing. It, it's very inconsistent. Some days I'm amazed with it. Some days I think it's a piece of junk. So we'll see what tonight brings when I'm on the when I'm at the gym. Well we, will it help if Trent Reznor was in charge of programming it? Yeah. <laughs> no idea. Uh, that was from Eddie Ragassa. We also have one from John Bernzing who says, Does turn by turn directions and iOS maps use cellular data or does the GPS radio operate separately? Both. Uh, if you turn off data, you can still get GPS, but the map tiles will not load behind it. So you will see a beautiful dot of exactly where you are in the middle of nowhere. If you want the map tiles, it'll cache a certain amount of map tiles, uh, but if you go off route or, or you go beyond the cache, uh, it'll have to pull them off the cell towers. And also, it's, it's a GPS in the iPhone, like most phones, because processing GPS is incredibly intensive, and if they can get the massive computers at the cell towers to do it and then just pass along the post-crunched information, it's much more efficient for your phone. So if your phone has to do the GPS itself, it's got to find the three satellite signals, it's got to cross-reference them, it takes longer to get a lock, uh, and it burns much more power. So keep your cell radios on. So I, got, I answered this question on the blog, but we keep getting it over and over again. Um, Peter, I gave my two cents already. Should you wait for an iPhone 6 likely in the fall? So yeah, so release date for the iPhone 6, people keep asking. For the last two years, it's been roughly the same week every year. Apple can change that, but you know, if you're a betting man, if you're in Vegas, um, I wouldn't really worry about one coming this month or That's next a- month. Yeah, that's exactly right. As to the, the, the inevitable should I buy now or should I wait question, the, the answer to that, the, the straightforward answer to that is buy when you need something. You know, if, if you don't need something, then wait. Circumstances may change, though. Maybe your phone will break. Maybe um, you'll get an amazing deal from a carrier to switch. Maybe um, you, you suddenly, oh, excuse me, come into a lot of money. Oh managed to avoid sneezing into the microphone there, yay. Um, you know, your circumstances can always change, and, and then all of a sudden it may not be as, as big a deal, or there may be a, a compelling reason to go uh, in a different direction. But um, you will always benefit by c- procrastinating on your purchasing decision, because if there's one truth 
eternal truth to buying technology, whether it's a new Mac, a new car, or a new phone, um, you will always get a better model if you wait for next year's model to show up. The only uh, additional advice we have on that is a lot of our readers have taken to buying the new phone and then selling it a couple, like just around the time of the next announcement because iPhones keep their resale value uh, pretty well and you can mitigate a lot of the purchase price of your next phone. So yes, it does cost more than just upgrading every two years, but if you're an Uber geek and you absolutely have to have the latest phone every year, you can buy it this year, sell it next year, and spend a little bit of money making up the difference and have that new phone every year. So if you want the 5S now, buy it, keep it in good shape, sell it, buy the iPhone 6 in the fall. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great being on here. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Likewise. Peter, always great having you here. Nice to chat, real life again. Thank you very much. I noticed that you say it's not a pleasure to talk to me, but I, I just said I, I said it right I mean, before you. Oh, I'm, I'm kidding. I, so such a diva. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's lovely to talk to you, Renee. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for coming on this week. Thanks for having me. Good talking to you too. And everyone in the chat room, you people are beautiful and intelligent, and we value your time. So thank you for being there. Uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks, guys. <laughs>